Hello and welcome to the Rangers Journal. My name is Kai Watson. Today I'll be chatting all things Rangers with a very special guest. So today we're joined by Mr Hartenham himself, David Edgar. So welcome, David. Oh, hi, Kai. Thank you very much for, for having me on. Nice to be here. And if you haven't seen the pictures already, David's obviously in Lisbon right now. He's pretty much living at the stadium. So if you could maybe just tell us what's the atmosphere like over there just now, kind of between fans and amongst everyone that's over there? Oh, um, you know, the Bears are, are having a good time as always. Um, and, uh, you know, settling in for for the trip, been arriving in, uh, over the last couple of days. I've seen a few of them at the stadium. I was down at the stadium this morning. And uh, so a few of them, few of them there over. Uh, it's just it as a you know, I keep looking over there because that's where it is. It's like two hundred yards away from me. Um, it is an impressive place. It's very similar to it was the same architect um, that built the Emirates as well. Kind of modelled it off this. So um, a big club with a lot of history. There's the statue of Eusebio when you come up to the to the place. They've got some brilliant things that say really things I think we should maybe think about at Ibrox, you know, like lists of international players and trophies won. And um, so it's, a, it's an impressive place uh, to, to play football. And then you're, you're aware that you're one of Europe's historic clubs, but we are as well. And speaking to, to some of the local, um, what, uh, you, you, what comes across is the mood is kind of a bit down and a bit angry unsurprisingly, after they got battered 5 nil by Porto at the weekend. Um, so it could go one of two ways. I think that they, what they want and what they hope is that the team reacts and comes flying out the gates and gets a quick start and, you know, gets the fans on side. But the concern is that if they don't and they come out and they're a little bit nervy and feeling their way into the game and Rangers start well and get you know, about spells of possession, maybe even take the lead. Their view is that the stadium will turn toxic. So I think that has to be an ambition for us tonight to try and make sure that rather than being a weapon for them, that the home crowd actually can be difficult. And we, look, we're Rangers fans. We've seen it at Ibrox ourselves. We've seen it at Ibrox, unfortunately, this season when the fans are just not happy at all with with what's going on and they express it and you know the howls of frustration and they get on the backs of the players that's something for us to work at tonight that that i think has to be a legitimate aim so it's a very interesting time to play them definitely without obviously want to talk about our rivals too much i think they're in a very similar spot to what celtic have been in recently obviously they've just lost their place at the top of the league as well they were getting results despite like we had the guys from the Long Ball Football podcast on, Balney and Albert were kind of talking about mm. despite them getting results, fans weren't happy with the football on show. I don't think they see Roger Schmidt as a good fit for what fans are used to seeing, what they want to see. They kind of want to see that. They've obviously got a team full of talented kind of Portuguese, South American players. They want to see kind of fluid attacking football and it doesn't seem to be what the fans are seeing. Obviously, previously they were getting results. Obviously, they've lost their place at the top of the league, and like you said, they get absolutely hammered at the weekend. So, oh, it's annihilated. interesting time to play them. And the fact I think yeah. Schmidt's job's maybe on the line because I did see a there's few not, reports throughout the week that they were looking at getting rid of him. Yeah, there's not a lot of love for him. Um, and that uh, uh, that is interesting. What, what does come across is that the football they were playing isn't kind of what they expect, what they feel Benfica should play. Um, and if you're doing that, you have to be winning. Any any big club who, especially one who feels that they have a tradition of playing in a certain style and playing with, as you mentioned, there that kind of verve, that South American flair brought to the party. Um, if you you're not doing that, you at least have to be winning because the the results are all that you can hang on to. Um, we saw earlier in the season a now infamous game against Motherwell when Rangers were awful, really awful. We won the game, but the fans were really angry and upset. And I think justifiably so because the performance was was awful. Um, and that that's definitely it. There, there seems to me, I mean, he spoke in his press conference, Roger Schmidt, about the outside noise. I don't think that's ever a good sign when a manager is referring to how he's ignoring the outside noise because that, of course, is an admission that there is that outside noise, that there is this much. Um, I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be surprised if he was here long term, put it that way. I think a lot of the fans here have made their mind up that they could do better 
And when that happens, it becomes very difficult at any club, but particularly at a big club, to turn that around because fans have made their mind up on him, I think, already. So he's a man under pressure. The story that won't go away here this week is the uh, non-apology. I know that sometimes we might think in Scotland that our media focus on what's said more than what happens on the pitch. But, you know, it's been similar here. After they got beaten by Porto 5-0, he was asked if he would apologise and he said, no, you know, it's not that we deliberately went out to lose, which I think is fair, but it maybe didn't, it wasn't politic, it didn't quite understand the reality of the situation. Uh, and he got asked about it seconds in his press conference yesterday. They had to send out the club president, Rui Costa, who did apologise. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of unhappiness and we need to try, we, we can't just look at that and say, well... That's nothing to do with us. This is a, a thing we can work on. This is some that's a button we can press tonight. And if we do that, then it becomes a different challenge entirely because you know, this place holds what well, seventy thousand. Um if they're all roaring and right behind the team and loving it, that's a difficult and a hostile environment for us to play football in. If that seventy thousand is turned on the backs of their own players, game changes completely. Just even talking about Schmidt and his lack of apologies, something I want to know if it was mentioned at the press conference yesterday was a scene after the game, and I think it was like 24 hours after, the Benfica social media team hadn't posted anything since the fourth goal went in. Like they didn't <laughs> announce that there was a fifth the goal, they didn't, they didn't have a full-time post, there was nothing for it. I don't know if it's... I'd do it's that, I'd, I'd leave, yeah, I, I admire that, not... I, just I'm not we'll take part anymore. Um, he, he, he was asked about the, the mood around the club, and he said, well, you know, we, obviously we were angry, that we had, but we're ignoring the noise. We're focusing on ourselves. We know what we're capable of. Um, it, 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 he looked like a man under pressure. And he is a man under pressure. And the thing is, even if they do go out and beat us tonight, I don't necessarily think that pressure will lift. It's not, it, it, they haven't arrived here quickly, if that makes sense. It's not based on one result. One result, of course, being that bad has been perhaps a catalyst for it ramping up. But, um, you know, one result would get them out of it either. So uh, there is a kind of long road ahead. And I think the general feeling is bar something miraculous, um, then I think that, there's a, a kind of growing swell of opinion that they'll, they'll make a change in the summer for them. So um, that, you know, football managers are humans. They know when that's the kind of situation that they're walking into. So uh, like I say, he is aware of it, to, that there's a lot of fans here who would rather see the back of them. So going on the press conference, obviously, from kind of the Rangers' point of view and what Philip Clement had to say Fabio Silva's obvious up as well. What was your biggest kind of takeaways from our side of the presser? For me, it was hints, no more than that, about a possible change of shape and about possible change of, of tactics. Now, normally coaches are very reluctant to do it if they tend to stick to a system. And the reason for that is obvious that they don't have time to coach and to drill in a new system. Um, if you're going to, you know, if and if you've been training all season to play one particular style, one particular system, uh, then I think that if you then go and change it, it can be quite difficult for players to adapt to. Uh, the other side of the coin is players need to be adaptive. It's not something that they're unfamiliar with. It's not a wild, crazy system. It's not, you know, like we're going to play the 3-1-3-3 three, three, three from mid-90s Ajax here. It's we're going to play a three at the back with two wing backs in the midfield. But a lot of it, I think, will depend on player avail availability. The manager pointed out he's got five wingers and four of them are injured. And if Ross McCausland, who they'll make a decision on today, fails to make it, then it's five wingers missing. Um, and Therefore, what do you do? Do you play someone who isn't a winger in that position? I know we've got Dujon Sterling who can play multiple positions. Or do you go, right, well, we'll, we'll go with a three at the back and we'll, we'll maybe have a different type of wide area where we're pushing our two fullbacks into those positions. So uh, that's really the first I can remember him. He, he talks a lot about solutions, the manager. That's a word he uses a lot. Um, and and it's a good attitude. You, you hear it from him a lot where he gets asked about a problem and he says, I, I don't want to talk about making an excuse. I need to find a solution. That's my job. Um, but that was the first I'd heard them actually then take it to the next step, which is that might mean 
a change of shape. That might mean a change of style for this match. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we line up tonight, who lines up. Does that mean that we get, say, Ben Davis in and we go with a three at the back? Um, and therefore, you know, you'd imagine that, that Tavernier and Yilmaz would be asked to perform a wing-back role, both of which, incidentally, they're are capable of, there's no, no issues there. And then you can maybe let a tight midfield and that would maybe mean two up front, so you might get Silva and Dessels. So, yeah, I'm really interested to to see the team line up tonight just to see if the manager does do that. He, he said it himself, though. He, he literally did come out and say, if we didn't have injuries, it would be a different team. Everyone knows that. You know, he's not trying to pretend that the team that takes to the field tonight would be the team that would have if we had, for example, Sima and Cortez, etc., etc. You just go through the injuries. Uh, we do have a lot of attacking talent missing, and he's he's having to just kind of make do and find solutions. I think it's obviously the case, like you say, managers and players also need to be adaptive. It's not the system he wants to play. He's probably never came across kind of injury issues like Rangers have had, I don't think over the last couple of years, many teams have had, especially like you say, if McCausland's out, five out of five wingers. I don't remember kind of ever no. seeing that about. So if we do go three at the back, what kind of what kind of lineup would you like to see? Would you like to see the two strikers? Or would you like to see like a Silva in behind Dessers? Would you just go with the two up top? Obviously, two fullbacks playing high and probably Lundstrom and Sterling in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, if if they're going with the three, and I don't know the fitness of the players in terms of if Ross McCausland will make it, but if we just say we start the conversation from we're assuming they'll go with a three, let's might not happen, but we're just saying if it did. Um, for me, it would be Butland. Then you would go with the the three being Adam Suter on the right, Golson in the middle, Ben Davis on the left, um, Yilmaz and, and Tav as a fullback. Yilmaz is obviously on the left, Tav obviously on the right. Then I would go with quite a tight midfield three of um, Lundstrom and Sterling with Tom Lawrence sitting just in front of them. And then well, we only have two fit strikers, so it would be uh it, it would be Cortez at uh, Cortez, it would be um Dessels and Silva. Silva, I think would be the one who would run the channels, you know, that that he likes to go and take the ball. So he would have that ability to move. I don't think he would necessarily play right in behind because then you're forcing Tom Lawrence back a little bit. And Tom Lawrence would, would be, I think, more effective in that space. But you can say to Silva, right, you know, if you want to come off wide and go and support whichever fullback or, or wing back it is that's that's moving forward, then you can do that. Whereas Cyril, you stay between between the posts to try and get on the end of things. So uh, look, the players are there for it to work. The question is, how often have they trained like this? How often have they drilled like this? Uh, will there be too big a period of readjustment during the game? In which case, could the game be taken away from you as you're getting used to it? These are all factors a manager has to consider. Um, and if not, then it's a case of saying if maybe Ross McCausland can start. You play a similar lineup, but McCausland would play rather than Davies, and you would go with um, Silva and Ross McCausland as your wingers and and uh, Dessers in the middle. So he has that flexibility. I think that little bit of flexibility that the squad currently being shown with so many players allows him. Um, and it'll just be a decision for him at the time. But I do think we have the players to play a 3-5-2 without it being too huge a culture shock to them. I think the maybe the biggest issue you look, you look at in the 3-5-2, not personally as a player, but the fact that obviously Ben Davis has hardly kicked the ball. He's obviously yes. capable of playing in that position. He's comfortable on the ball. He's a decent passer of the ball as well. Like It's no doubt in his ability to play. It's just maybe the lack of minutes. Like you say, we do have players are a bit flexible, like Lawrence can play deeper, he can play in the 10, he's played out in the left a lot of his career, especially yeah, for Derby. Derby. Silva can kind of play off the left, through the middle. Because I, I don't really like him on either side, but you can play him on the left also. Then obviously if you wanted to move Sterling up into that kind of right wing slot, that, that option's also there. It depends how you're looking at, if we're looking at going to Benfica, or if you're looking at kind of, counteracting what they're doing. I kind of like the fact that when Clement's come in, he's focused on us mm -hmm. instead of kind of us being worried about the opponents, but we've obviously not had... Betis, Betis was a big game. I'm not saying Betis wasn't a big game, but I think this is... I still see Betis are kind of languishing about mid-table in the league now, the, the great home record. 
in that it's kind of fell away a wee bit. But I think Benfica's a completely different animal when you look at that. So if you had if you had to pick McCausland's fit, do you play him? Do you risk it? Or do you go with the three at the back? I, I would probably go... Uh, uh, it depends how fit. Are you going to put him on and then there's a, a real risk that 20 minutes later he's, he might be coming off? Or he can only play 45 minutes, in which case you're going to have to make a change anyway. So I think I would probably start with the three at the back with McCausland on the bench to come on if we want to change it and maybe push and go for it towards the end of the match. Um, otherwise, I think if you've got a player who's 50-50, well, they're not going to be able to play 90. That's that's for certain. Um, the other thing you could do, I suppose, is you play Scott Wright on the right-hand side and you play um, Fabio Silva on the left, and that allows you to keep to your usual fate, and that means you're not moving the rest of the team about. Um, you know, Wright has his, his critics, and I think that his output isn't enough. But in terms of on a night like this, will he be in the right places? Will he's off the ball work be up to scratch, which you need in a game like this? If you remember a few years ago, Brandon Barker in, in Porto, uh, here in Portugal, um, did that kind of job. And, and Wright could do that. Um, so there is that, that other option that is available to the manager. But yeah, he certainly doesn't have a lot of cards to play tonight. I think that, that's a fair thing to assume. Talking about the defensive work as well, it's probably harder if you're playing a winger to play on the left hand side tonight. So I know a few people that have kind of spoken about Benfica and how they play, talk about how they can they can't press from the front as much when Di Maria is there. Yes. Like obviously world class footballer, world cup winner, Champions League winner, but as much as he has the legs going forward, he's never really had the legs going back, and even less so now. So I think it's more difficult for that. If you're asking Silva, who's obviously the striker, striker come winger, if you're asking him to play there, I think you're asking a lot of him to get back. I don't think in terms of asking a lot, like in terms of his engine, but in terms of his play style, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's a game he'd be really used to playing, having to be back there, and obviously they are pure it's bad, the right fullback as well, likes to bomb forward, so you're asking to kind of track that run and help. Presumably Yelma's in there with Di Maria. Do you think that if we do go with Silva, or do you think we've got a player that can play on the left-hand side that can fulfil that role of being able to pretty much support the fullback when it would be a two-on-one most of the time? Well, you can always shove Dujo on anywhere, can't you? Um, and he'll, he'll give you a decent performance. Again, that do you play then Barisic with Yilmaz further forward? These are all things that the manager normally wouldn't, I'm sure, even be looking at. But given the, the scarcity of players within the squad, he, he has to... Um, I, I, I think it'll be really interesting. What you do know is that everyone who goes out tonight, regardless of whether they're being asked to play in a slightly different position or, or even a, a radically different position, they will know their job. No one will be sent out there with half an instruction sheet, basically. They will know what the manager requires of them tonight. And if he sends them out to do it, it will be because he sees something in their skill set that says they can do it. Um, he doesn't ask players to do things they're not capable of, which I think is a kind of blight of modern coaches that, you know, they see something, a, a team at a very high level playing a certain way and they want to try and ape it. And that's fine. But if, you, you know, if the guy doesn't have the ability to do the job of which you're asking him to do, he doesn't have the skill set to do it, he's not going to be able to do it. Um, so that's one of the things I really like about Philip Clement. He will send people out there to do things that he knows they have the ability to do. Um, and I think that the, the best exponent of that has been Dujon Sterling. He saw something in him that said, you can play centre midfield that, that none of us as fans had considered. And then we saw what we got and it was like, well, right, you're spot on. So yeah, whoever goes out tonight in whatever position, they will, they will have a job and they will know specifically what the manager requires of them. Um, I don't think he would send someone out as you mentioned there, to, to I need you to get back, even though you're not really capable of getting back. He wouldn't do that, I don't think. No, I think that's one of one of the many things he's gonna do is he's come in. Like you said, he's not asking, he's not fitting square pegs and round holes. So yes. like I think he's that's why I don't think that's kind of why I asked the question about so I don't think he would do that because that's one of the kind of weak points that most of the 
anyone that's going to spoke about Benfica this week, they've highlighted how the press is more difficult with Di Maria there, but he's obviously a massive danger going forward. So he's, Absolutely. He's, not player, he's not a player you can ignore at all. Certainly not. not a wee bit like um, Isco, who was fantastic against us, with the acceptance that he will not be tracking back. And if you have a player like that, you, you have to make allowances for that. Uh, and I'm sure they will. But equally, it's impossible to always make you know complete allowances for it. There will always be a gap. It's just, are the other team good enough to find that gap? And we were in, in Betis. We were able to find those spaces that came about because, as you mentioned, within a press, if there's some piece of the jigsaw not there, there's a gap. And Rangers were able to exploit that. So that's something to look at. With the counter being, when he gets the ball anywhere from 40 yards in, he's a danger. Uh, that's obviously the way to look at it as well. Like, Obviously, if we turn it over, as much as he's not been in the press to go back, he's now a player in space if we've pushed he's up. He's now in space with ability. Um, and we've all seen him score great goals as well. You can't just rely on, well, I want him hitting a shot from outside the box. So you need someone to get out to him. You can't rely on just, you know, domestically we're sometimes happy enough to let people shoot from distance because more often than not it's going to end up in Rose Ed. I don't necessarily think I'd be letting Angel Di Maria have three or four against <laughs> Ian. So yeah, that that as you say, it's something that you have to be aware of that he is a player who can produce something out of nothing. And and I think Esco is a very good example of it. He was sensational against us, but it just the style of player that he had and what his position was in the team allowed certain little pockets of space to develop and we were good enough to find them and exploit them. I think with, with players like that, obviously you remember you remember them going forward. I still think the same about, obviously a lot of people think that that Raquel May performance at Ibrox is one of the best I've ever yeah. seen and probably never put a tackle in that game, but no one remembers <laughs> that. You remember who they was when they got on the ball, how good they is going forward. As much as you think you can exploit that, when it goes the other way, it's really hard to stop players of that quality. Yeah, and, and we do have to accept that they're quality players and they will be capable. The, the thing for me is, at this level, you do sometimes have to accept, as painful as it is, that you might get done with something brilliant. right? You might get done with something brilliant. What can you do to minimise it? What can you do to minimise it? And that means don't hand them anything. Don't make it Simple, don't give the ball away in a in a, a crucial area. Don't mess up a clearance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. If you do everything almost perfectly and they still score, sometimes you just have to hold your hands up and say, right, fair enough, that happens. Um, but it's it's don't make it you don't don't give away the ball on the edge of the box. You know, don't be clearing the ball into the centre of the area from set pieces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and they do, they, they have areas you can get. Uh, Otamendi's not what he was, not anyone near what he was. Um, they have players you can get at, and we need to focus on that. But as always in Europe, it's about what you, what you do when you have the ball. Because if you give it away cheaply and consistently, you're dead. You've got no chance, right? European teams will just... They, they'll eat you up doing that. Their technical level is too high to do it. Um, in Scotland, you we can give the ball away and the chances are we'll get it back quite quickly. That's not the case at this level. So it, look, these are all things, though, that the team has demonstrated over the past five, six seasons that it does know. These are lessons that they are aware of and that's why they've continued to, to do really well in European competition. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. As I say, it'll be, it'll be a tough night, very tough night. Um, but we come out of it in a, a decent spot, then oh, next week will be mega. So this is obviously not, see, this prediction might change when we see the team she also, but right now, how do you think they're going to go? What's your score prediction for tonight? I think that they'll they'll very much come at us. Um, I think they will be looking to, to lick the wounds um, of the weekend. But if we stay compact together, calm, uh, especially in the opening 20, I think that could, could put a lot of pressure on them. I think we do have pace and ability on the break. So I'll, I'll go for a one each. Um, aware that it could be, you know, anything can happen tonight. Um, and it really is just almost rolling a dice to come up with a score. So I'll go with my heart and say that 1-1 uh, one, one tonight. 
um, would set us up for Ibrox. But even if it is, you know, two one to them or whatever, you're still one 0 to them. You're still very much in the tie. Um, and the, the thing is to remember, it is a you know we were great at this in the run to Seville that it's three hours, it's not ninety minutes. You don't need to go hell for leather the last five minutes tonight. Um, I remember when we played um, Leipzig in Leipzig and they scored with eight minutes to go. And after the game, I was speaking to a couple of uh, German reporters and they said, oh, we were surprised you didn't really push to get the, the equaliser. And I said, well, we were surprised you didn't push to get the second because one won't be enough for you at Ibrox. We, we, and they were like, oh, no, you know, one nil's great. You know, that the pressure's on you. So that maturity to know that it's a three-hour game rather than a 90-minute game, just make sure you're staying in it tonight. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose your discipline. Even if it's tough and you can see the goal, the important thing is don't panic. Just remember there's a long, long time to go in this game. No, I'd be a bit more of a high-scoring game. I'm going to go for a two each. That would be you nice. Know, that's quite a pop. Quite a well, pop the last thing we played, it was five each across the two games, wasn't it? So, so maybe. I'm not, not sure the blood pressure can take that again. No, God, no. I'm going to, I'm going to go for a two each again. It might change once the kind of lineups come out. It might feel different about it. But like you say, it's really important to keep it at least tight the first 20 minutes. We yes. don't need to go and show that we're going to attack them. We just need to show that they're not going to have everything their own way. And I think that's yes. the most important point is if we keep it tight, those 20 minutes, like you say, with the position they're in, the fans, I'm not saying they're unanimously against the manager, but there's a very high percentage of them because I don't want the manager there. So just frustrating them, I think, is the main thing at the start of the game. If we can do that and not concede, then I think we've got a good chance in this tie. Yeah, fingers crossed. So thank you very much for joining us, David. Just Pleasure. let the guys know, I'm assuming everyone knows where they can find you anyway, but just let the guys know where they can find you online. Yeah, uh, go to patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. And if you want to find out more about it before you go there, go to heartandhand.co.uk. So thanks very much for listening. Hopefully we'll have a nice night tonight and have a great day. <laughs>